Welcome to our evening worship. We're glad to have you with us and we trust that we'll know the Lord's blessing as we worship him together. And we'll begin this evening by reading from God's word. I'm going to read Psalm 104. Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honour and majesty, who cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind, who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. You who laid the foundations of the earth, so that it should not be moved forever. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the voice of your thunder they hastened away. They went up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys, to the place which you founded for them. You have set a boundary that they may not pass over that they may not return to cover the earth. He sends the springs into the valleys which flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them the birds of the heavens have their habitation. They sing among the branches. He waters the hills from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your works. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread which strengthens man's heart. The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted where the birds make their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees The high hills are for the wild goats. The cliffs are a refuge for the rock badgers. He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knows it's going down. You make darkness and it is night, in which all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. When the sun arises, they gather together and lie down in their dens. Man goes about his work and to his labour until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions, this great and wide sea, in which are innumerable teeming things, living things both small and great. There the ships sail about, and there is that leviathan which you have made to play there. These all wait for you, that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them they gather in. You open your hand, they are filled with good. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath. They die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit. They are created and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth and it trembles. He touches the hills and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord. As long as I live, I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to him. I will be glad in the Lord. May sinners be consumed from the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Well, let's praise him together, this King of all creation, the Lord God Almighty.
as we sing our first hymn. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious God and Father, the mighty God, the creator and sustainer of all things, the eternal one from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord of hosts. Father, we bow before you. We bring you our praise and our adoration. We bring you our thanksgiving. For you, O Lord, are indeed the one who has set in their place all the things that we see around us. You indeed, O Lord, are the one who holds together all of your creation. For by your hand, all of these things have been made. You, O Lord, spoke and it was done. And we humbly bow in your presence, O Lord our God, the one who is sovereign over all things, the one who is our Heavenly Father and our Saviour, our God and our King. And Father, we are so thankful for the privilege which is ours to be able to approach your throne of grace, to know, O Lord, that you are present with us, because you, O oh Lord, have purpose to save us from all of our sins. For indeed, O oh Lord, we were so very far away from you. Our sins in your eyes, O oh Lord, were so very, very great. And your wrath and your condemnation was upon us, and we were deserving of it all, for we had no thought for you. 
We had no desire in our hearts at all, O Lord, to live according to your word or to, to, or to consider that which you have made known to us in your word, the Bible. And yet, Father, we praise you for that wonderful verse in the scripture which tells us that even while we were still sinners, even while we were still rebelling against you, even while we still had no thought for you, you, O Lord, because you had set your love upon us, because you had chosen us since before the foundation of the world, you came into this world in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might seek and save us out of our sins, that you might come into this world to pay the penalty and to be a ransom for us. How we thank you and praise you, our God, for our Saviour who went to the cross in our place, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We thank and praise you for his perfect and sinless life. We worship you, O Lord, for his atoning and sacrificial death. And we praise you, O Lord our God, that he is the risen and living Saviour, one day to return and to take us to be with himself. And even now, O Lord, having sent his Spirit into our hearts, he himself is indeed our light and our life. He is our hope and he is our strength. And we ask, O Lord our God, that we would be helped and encouraged again in these wonderful truths this evening. Lord, we know and we confess that too often, Heavenly Father, our faith burns low. Our love for you is but lukewarm. Our walk with you is not as it ought to be. Too easily, O oh Lord, we become discouraged. Too easily, O oh Lord, we become distracted by the things of this world. Too often, gracious God, we fail to be the people of God that we ought to be. But Lord, you are merciful and you are loving and you are so very, very kind. And so, O oh Lord, we pray that you would deal with us right now, once more in your mercy and in your grace. Forgive us, O oh Lord, our many failings and our backslidings. Restore us and heal us once more. Renew us again, Heavenly Father. Renew us in heart and mind and in spirit. Renew our zeal and our love for Christ, that, O oh Lord, we might have an urgent and a very real experience of being in Christ Jesus and of him dwelling within us by his Spirit. That these things, O oh Lord, would be those things which mark us out in this world, even in our homes and, and our, in our places of work or study. Revive us once more, O oh Lord, gracious God, that we might live to the praise and glory of your great name, that we might know once more what it is to find in you, Heavenly Father, the one who is our light and our salvation and our strength. Be with those, Lord, who are struggling in these days. Be with those who as yet do not know the Saviour and who lie outside of your kingdom. Grant, O oh Lord, that in all of the upheaval that continues around this world, that you will cause many, O oh Lord, to consider the futility of so many things that they've considered to be of value and of worth, that they might look unto you, that they might be reminded, O oh Lord, that this life is very short and that eternity is very long and we are so fragile, we are but the dust of the earth, which one day is and the next day is gone 
and its place remembers it no more. And so, Lord, we pray that in your kindness and in your mercy that you, O Lord, will be at work in the lives of many, bringing many to a realisation that there is something so deep, so vast, which is missing from their lives, and that that great void within their soul can only be filled and healed by coming to you in repentance and faith and to the Lord Jesus Christ and coming to the foot of the cross and casting our burdens and our sins upon him and trusting in him for repentance and faith. Lord, we pray that you be with us in these days. Encourage us together. O oh Lord, that we might live lives which show forth the glories of Christ that, Lord, your grace and your goodness might be seen in us, that we might have a real zeal, O Lord, to share with others the good news of the gospel, that, Lord, we might give ourselves to holiness and to righteousness of life, that the very life of Christ indeed, O Lord, might be planted deep within each one of us who belong to you, and that we might grow that we might bear much fruit, that we might grow up into him who is the head of the church and that we might become more and more Christ-like to your glory and to your praise. Help us as we consider your word together. Grant us wisdom. Might your word, O Lord, do its piercing work within our souls might it do its transforming and instructive work in our minds. Might it change our hearts. Might it cause us, O oh Lord, to fall before you again in humble worship and adoration. To confess once more, O oh Lord, our great need of you, the living God. For we are indeed as nothing before you. We are as but a vapour, which one day is and then is blown away. For you are the eternal God. O oh, grant, O oh Lord, that our lives might be builded and founded upon you and your truth in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so hear us and bless us. Be merciful to us, we pray. Grant us a rich blessing now. For Christ's sake, in whose name we ask. Amen. If you have a Bible, please turn once again to the Psalms, and this time to Psalm 27. Over the next few Sunday evenings, I'm going to be selecting a few verses from this psalm. We'll make our way through it gradually and uh, we'll get to the end of the psalm. It's just 14 verses, this particular psalm, so a comparatively short one, but containing some glorious truths. It's written by David and the psalms that he wrote always seem to be particularly poignant and helpful they so often seem to be right on the mark, right on the button. Uh, all the kinds of experiences that we have, he had. Uh, all the kinds of doubts and fears and worries. Uh, all were known to him. And as we see how he responds to all of these things, and as we see how uh, you dealt with him in God dealt with him in all of his mercy and grace. Um, we're just so blessed to have these uh, psalms in our hands. And psalm 27 uh, is no different to that as a psalm of David. And uh, we'll read the whole psalm. This evening we're just going to be looking at the first three verses. But we'll read the whole psalm together. Psalm 27, beginning at the first verse. The Lord is my light 
and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing the praises of the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Well, may he help us to do just that as we consider his word, both uh, this evening and in the weeks to come. How vast the benefits divine which we in Christ possess. We are redeemed from sin and shame and called to holiness. Thou wast thyself our surety in God's redemption plan. In thee his grace was given us long before the world began. Not one of all the chosen race, but shall to heaven attain. Here they will share abounding grace, and there with Jesus reign. Well, let's sing that hymn before we turn to God's word together.
If the news commentators are correct, there are many people living in fear right now. And the things about which they are afraid probably seem to be reasonable causes for fear. They fear sending their children back to school. They fear the loneliness of many more weeks in isolation. They fear this virus because it seems that no one can be sure just what kind of effect it might have upon them. Will I be one of those who fall severely ill or worse? They fear dying separated from loved ones. They fear loved ones dying separated from them. They fear losing their job or their business, not getting their, their place at university in the autumn. They fear that so many of the plans they'd made are just falling apart at the seams. Yet again and again, the Bible tells us that it's possible to live without that kind of fear. The Bible exhorts us not to be afraid, but instead to trust in the living God. Now, these exhortations are directed towards those who have a firm belief and trust and hope in God. It's not that God wants us to be cold-hearted and unfeeling. It's not that he requires us to adopt some sort of stoical, stiff upper lip. It's not that he expects us to just not care. It's not even that you don't any longer have genuine concerns. Of course you'll have things which continue to be a concern to you. I'm not going to suggest that you'll never walk into an exam and not have butterflies in your stomach. It's not that once you're saved, you'll never again experience even the smallest degree of worry. I'm not even going to try and suggest that these verses that we're going to consider mean that feeling frightened in certain situations becomes a thing of the past, or is even wrong. There will still be times when you feel frightened. But God wants you to see that there is such a place of refuge for your soul and for your emotional life that you never need be gripped by terror. And the fear of something never needs to be a reason for you to become trapped or immobilized like the proverbial rabbit in the headlights. Fear need never be the reason why you make a bad choice or a poor decision. Fear need never be the reason for you as a Christian to have a poor testimony. Not doing what you should do because you're afraid, going where you should not go, because you're frightened to take a stand and to say no and to be the odd one out. The Christian should never be ruled by fear. I know for a fact that there will be some listening to this who right now are overshadowed by fear perhaps even paralysed by it. Fear dominates all your thinking and governs so many of the choices that you make. But in Christ, you can live set free from that kind of fear. And before you're tempted to say, but Ian, you don't know what I'm going through, let me address that straight away. You're right. I don't, but I don't need to. I can't know what it feels like to be you in your position. But neither have you ever known what it's like to have been me in some of the positions that I've been in. But I do know God, and I do know the promises of his word. And I trust in him, 
and I believe his promises. The question is, do you? Will you? Why won't you? I want you to be able to repeat David's testimony as your own testimony. Well, let's begin to look at what he says. And let's see what we can learn together from these opening few verses. First of all, what we see in David is that we are to look first to God. David, first of all, in verse 1, considers the Lord. He looks to the Lord first and then considers those things which might cause him to fear in the light of who God is. So he says, the Lord, whom shall I fear? The Lord, of whom shall I be afraid? Look to God. Be looking to God. And then view earthly things so that they are seen in contrast to who God is. Where many Christians go wrong is they begin with their gaze set upon that thing which is causing their worries and their fears and they fix their eyes and their mind on that and it grows bigger and bigger and bigger until after a while it's grown so big and has become so dominant and so overwhelming it's almost impossible to think about anything else. Let me give you an example. On one occasion in the Old Testament we find the army of Israel camped on a hill on one side of a valley and on the far side an army has set up camp. The Philistines opposite the army of Israel. And every day these two armies square up to each other but then from out of the ranks of the Philistines strides a giant of a man, their champion warrior Goliath, all nine plus feet of him. That's three meters to you youngsters and he bellows out a challenge to Israel. Send out your champion to fight me. If I win, you are defeated and you will be our slaves. But if your champion can defeat me, then we are defeated and we shall be your slaves. Now, every time that happened, every man in Israel's army saw the same thing. They saw the ranks of the Philistine soldiers with Goliath standing in front of them. And when they went to bed at night and closed their eyes, all they could see was one thing, the ranks of the Philistine army with Goliath standing in front of them. And with each passing day, morning and evening, for 40 days, as Goliath repeated his challenge, he and that huge spear in his hand looked even bigger, even more fierce, and even more invincible. And after 40 days of looking at him, they could see nothing else. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 17, where you find the story, at verse 11, that they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Because all they could see was this impassable mountain of a man. And then along comes a young lad, almost certainly only still a teenager, and he witnesses this twice daily scene for the first time and watches as all the men of Israel turn and run back to camp, dreadfully afraid, we're told in the Bible. And David can't believe his eyes and ears. 
Who is this uncircumcised Philistine, he says, that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, why the difference? Why is David so different to all the other men in the army of Israel? Well, it's because here is a young lad who has a heart after God's own heart. Here is a young man with his eyes, his heart and his mind fixed on God. Here is a young man for whom God is everything and everywhere. In David's heart and mind, there is nothing to compare to the God of Israel who is the true and living God. And so David doesn't see a nine-foot giant who is so big, by the way, that just his bronze chain mail armour weighs nine stone. That's 56 kilograms for you youngsters. That's the same weight as having my 27-year-old son on his back. Plus the spear that the Bible describes as being like a weaver's beam and it has an iron spearhead that weighs nearly eight kilograms. That's a spearhead that weighs just over a stone for you oldies like me. David sees none of that. All he sees is a rotten, filthy Gentile who would, defi- who would dare to defy his God. Because here is a young lad who is so in communion with God and who God is and what God is like and what God has done for him. That when he looks at Goliath, Goliath is nothing compared to God. And it's because of that. That for David, Goliath holds no fear. You see, keep looking at the giant. Look only at the giant. And the giant seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Until you reach the point where even as a Christian, you've convinced yourself that even God cannot really do that much to help you with a giant that's as big as this. But look first to God. Keep looking to God. View the giant from the perspective of God seated on his throne in heaven. And the Goliaths of this world are not the giants that they seem to be. And you do not need to be afraid. Uh, By the way, that's not the main lesson actually from the story of David and Goliath of far greater importance is to see how David gains the victory as one man on behalf of the entire nation as a picture and a pointer to that victory which Christ would gain as one man on behalf of his whole church. His victory over sin and death is your victory over sin and death. Just needed to say that. But that's point one. Look first to God. And then secondly, in looking to God, remember who God is. It's difficult to remember who God is if all you're looking at is the giant. In the opening verse, David shows us that there are three things which he knows to be true about God. And which are the reason why he knows he has no need to be afraid. First of all, David says, God is his light. Let me remind you what we read in the opening of John's Gospel at verse 4 of the first chapter. All things were made through Christ and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of man. To say that God is your light is to know that God is the very source of life itself. God is the very centre of everything for David. 
And this is something of which he's very conscious. He has this constant awareness of the life and the presence of God. And light, of course, brings clarity and understanding. Light breaks through the darkness. This is a light that floods the soul with truth and with goodness. This is a light that brings understanding of God's word. And so David is able to, he's able to take hold of God's promises and to put his trust in them. Because God is his light. In the darkness of this sinful world, in the darkness of men's actions against him, in the darkness of oppression and persecution, in the darkness of illness and pain, in the darkness of unemployment and uncertainty. When the Christian can say and know that God is my light, then it is that the fears begin to subside. And secondly, David says, God is my salvation. Now, we thought last week about God not permitting you to be taken beyond that which you're able to bear without providing a means of escape. If you're in need of rescue, God will provide it. And even if whatever you're facing costs you your life, have you not meant it when you've sung no guilt in life? No fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. Do you mean that when you sing it? What are those words saying? God is my salvation. When you know that, when you live in the reality of it, then the fears will begin to subside. And then thirdly, David says, God is his strength. What a lesson it was that the Apostle Paul had to learn, and which is recorded for us, that we might learn it too, that God's grace is sufficient. In the grace of God, we discover a strength which is not our own, but which comes from heaven. So, for example, we hear the testimony of Job in verse 4 of chapter 4. Your words have upheld him who was stumbling, and you have strengthened the feeble knees. Have you known your knees knocking, trembling with fear? Job did, but God was his strength. God provides strength. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labours increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance when our strength has failed before the day is half done when we reach the end of our hoarded resources our father's full giving is only begun his love has no limit his grace has no measure his power has no boundary known unto men, for out of his infinite riches in Jesus he giveth, and giveth, and giveth again. We find Stephen before the Jewish council at the end of Acts chapter 6, and he knows he's in big trouble. The charges made against him carry the death penalty, and yet we read, that his face was as the face of an angel. And as he's being stoned to death, he kneels down and prays for the forgiveness of those who are taking his life. 
What is this that we see in Stephen? We see the Lord who is his light, his salvation and his strength. The date is the 16th of October, 1555. The place is what now is Broad Street in Oxford. There is something resembling a large but as yet unlit bonfire with an upright stake of wood in the middle. It's the beginning of the Reformation in these islands in which we live. And two men... Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley, convinced of the errors of the Roman Catholic Church, convinced that the Bible is the Word of God and that it is the source of all that we believe to be true, convinced that the Bible teaches the once for all atoning death of Christ, they are about to be burned to death because of what they believe. The men were chained back to back against the stake. And it's recorded that as the flames took hold, Hugh Latimer, now about 70 years old, turned to Nicholas Ridley and uttered these words. Be of good cheer, Master Ridley. Play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as shall never be put out. Because he knew the truth of these words, you see. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. That is precisely what David is talking about in Psalm 27. This is how and why David can say, Whom shall I fear? Of whom? Shall I be afraid? You see, David is, thirdly and finally, confident that God is greater. Whether it's David against Goliath, whether it's Gideon's 300 against the Midianites, it matters not how great is the foe that you face, because God will always be greater. Greater is he than is in you than he that is in the world, says the Apostle John in 1 John 4. The Old Testament prophet Elisha was being sought by the king of Syria, who eventually managed to track him down and arrived, well his army did anyway, at the city where Elisha was living. The king had sent chariots and horses and a vast army to apprehend Elisha and take him back to the king. It's not at all dissimilar to what we read in verse 3 of Psalm 27. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. For these men, it was literally an entire army against one man. For you, it will sometimes feel like it is. So the Syrian army have surrounded the entire city where Elisha is during the night. And Elisha had a servant and he was up first early the next morning. And as he went outside, he saw the Syrian army. And he began to turn round and as he spun full circle, looking all around the city, all he could see was horses and chariots and soldiers. 
he ran in to tell Elisha. And this is what Elisha said. These are the words of Elisha recorded in 2 Kings chapter 6. Don't fear, he says to his servant, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. At that point, probably the servant is looking around, wondering who on earth Elisha is talking about. And then we're told Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And God struck them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. This is exactly what David is talking about in verse 2 of Psalm 27. When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Because he had confident, confidence that God is greater. Augustus Montague, top lady, not only has a glorious name, he also wrote some of the most glorious hymns that the Church of Christ has ever sung and continues to sing. Listen to these words. A sovereign protector I have, unseen yet forever at hand, unchangeably faithful to save, almighty to rule and command. He smiles and my comforts abound. His grace, like the dew, shall descend. And walls of salvation surround the soul he delights to defend. Creator and ground of my hope, to your name alone I shall bow. A new Ebenezer set up to show God has helped us till now. I think on the years that are past, when all my defence you have proved, nor will you relinquish at last a sinner so blessed and so loved. Do not fear. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. How is it possible that the Christian may live set free from fear. It's not a call to adopting an irrational or irresponsible or unrealistic view of life. It's not an invitation to live in some sort of fantasy land where you think nothing can touch you. The dangers, the threats, the worries are all very real, as is your weakness to try and deal with any of them. But David here, and the Bible in many other places, calls the believer to fix your mind upon God and his truth. Look first to God and view all your struggles from the vantage point of the greatness of God. Remember who God is. He is your light, your salvation, and your strength. Be confident that God really is greater than any threat, any affliction that may ever come your way. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who walks beside, who floods my weaknesses with strength and causes fears to fly, whose every promise is enough for every step I take. 
sustaining me with arms of love and crowning me with grace. that we might know afresh that in you we have light and strength and salvation and that Lord you indeed would flood our weaknesses with your strength and that you would cause our fears to fly, that your grace might be sufficient for us all in whatever circumstance you call us to go through. Father, keep us and sustain us. Strengthen feeble knees confirm in our hearts that we belong to Christ and that we are his forever. To his praise and in his name. Amen. <laughs>